They're going to have spreadsheets already set up with all these formulas built in. I'll just plug in my numbers and that's it. And that's true, right? So most companies will have that. So you're absolutely right in thinking that. The one thing that I will stress though is that a lot of you here in the room won't actually end up working in chemical engineering after you finish. For whatever reason you choose. And that's, a, that's, that's, uh, that's quite okay. Uh, many of my colleagues that I graduated with are not working in chemical engineering. Many of them have gone out and gone to start their own restaurants and their own businesses. Four years of this. Four years of this, and then you figure, figure it out what you like the whole lot. So, um, so the, 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 the point is here from today's class is that what we're going to discuss here, I see used by small business owners, my colleague, uh, friends of mine have used these sorts of analysis to decide whether to open businesses in certain areas. This, the analysis that we're looking at here is matches exactly what you would be doing either for a large company or for your own company. So for those of you that are more small business oriented and going to start your own company one day, in engineering or non-engineering, this, uh, this is very relevant. And even if you don't do either of those cases, it's good to know the business environment. So when you hear people say, oh, there goes the government again giving companies tax breaks you can start to understand what's actually going on, where that money's flowing, right? And have a realistic conversation rather than a conversation just based on gut feel emotions. So let's take a look at what the government allows and doesn't allow. The government allows companies to depreciate equipment. So we said last class here, if we took the example of Suncor, there's certain things that are depreciable and which are not depreciable. And the things, the, the characteristics of goods that are depreciable are those that produce income for the company, they have value that exceeds a period of, or a lifetime, I should say, of, of the period of the year, and they lose value over time. And so those three characteristics are fairly easy to assess. Uh, there's only a few types of capital goods that are, that are kind of like in a gray area, but by and large, you'll find it very straightforward to determine if something's depreciable or not. <laughs> So what's all the interest around depreciation? Well, let's take a look at it. The government is giving a tax break. So the moment people get tax breaks, companies say, aha, I can try and maximize this. Okay, we all like, that's totally valid. Right? It's totally legal to minimize your tax burden. That's absolutely 100% legal. By whatever way you choose, you can minimize your tax burden and you go for it. So the government sets certain rules by which you can play. If you choose to use those rules, you can use it to your advantage. You can also not, right, and just pay more taxes. So let's look at how we can minimize taxes. So here's, here's a formula up here, we'll, we'll see it again later. Tax rate's fixed, it's 25%, so that's fixed. If we want to minimize our tax paid, you earn less income. So we don't like to do that. But what we can do is we like to maximize our eligible expenses and we like to maximize our depreciation. So you know why depreciation is important? Because the more, more of it that we have, the less tax we end up paying on that side of the equation. What's eligible expenses? Let's talk about that in a minute. So if companies pay tax on their income minus expenses, so this is very different to personal taxation. We, we spoke about that last time. But for corporate tax, companies can reduce their tax pay by maximizing their expenses. So this is great because they can start spending all their money to match their income so that this equation here is close to zero and they end up paying no tax. Okay, for, so companies would be motivated to do this. They would be motivated to do this so that they can pay less tax. Well, what's one way that you can start to think that you might minimize your taxes? You say, well, Look, we want to put up a new distillation column to double our production. That distillation column is going to cost $20 million. I get to write off $20 million with my tax. Does that sound fair? And it's an expense. I have to pay someone $20 million to purchase and install that distillation column. But can I write off that $20 million as an expense and reduce my tax by $20 million? Okay, 
Okay, so the government here is saying certain expenses are eligible, others are not eligible. Okay. So in that case, would you have to wait until the project is completed and capitalized and then take off depreciation amounts? Okay, so the question now is timing. Okay, that's all. That's uh, when, when can one start taking off this money? So the, the, your gut feel here is like, no, it just doesn't sound quite right. And that's correct. You, you cannot just suddenly take off $20 million here. But what the government does allow you to do is say, look, that $20 million you're investing is going to last a long period of time. I'm going to let you take off that $20 million, but you cannot do it all in one go right now. I'm going to allow you to spread it out over a period of time, and you can take off chunks of money until over a period of time you'll eventually have $20 million deducted. But I'm not going to let you do it all at once in one single tax year. Okay, and that's what that last term is. That depreciation term is essentially accounting for large capital costs that occur, big item, these equipment that are going to be installed, but instead of allowing, the government doesn't allow you to subtract it here, but what they do is they allow you to subtract it over there, but broken up over periods of time. So that's what we're going to look at today. Like you said the government will pay payments on a long period of time, right? Well, they no, so they don't. So the government is smart, right? They're not going to allow the time value of money on those deductions. Um, and that's what we're going to see today as well. We'll make a note of that. Okay. So the government will allow you to take off those expenses, but just not in one big whack. Because otherwise what will end up happening is that companies will, will just find reasons to spend money so that they end up paying no tax. But they will, what the government will do is allow you to spread it out over some period of time. So let's take a look at how that's done then. Um, so let's, uh, before we get to that point, let's just quickly talk about eligible versus not eligible expenses. So an eligible expense is one up here that allows you to reduce your tax pay. So it's one that I can deduct here. And this includes pretty much every expense except major capital items. So it's actually easier to look at what non-eligible expenses are and then everything else is, is eligible. So improvements to your equipment, <coughs> engineering, Shipping installation, land improvements, site preparation, um, and actually there's, there's one that's kind of missing here is the actual cost of the equipment itself. That's uh, pretty important. That should be in there. That's a non, those are non-eligible expenses. So the equipment itself and all the costs associated with shipping it to your site, installing it at your site, the design and engineering required to get that equipment up and running, and any improvements to your building and land you need to make to get that equipment in. Why is this significant for other How does the government decide to So these are all non-eligible. These are going we are going to depreciate. So the government will allow you to subtract these over time in the third term in the private equation. But why? What means is this time? Okay, because these these improvements are of a long term nature. Okay, so in one tax, the benefits from installing new equipment are going to last multiple tax years, not just one tax year. Okay, so it's not fair to reduce your tax in one tax year on something that's going to last you a long period of time. What's the difference between buying your first installation call and startup costs? Okay, so startup costs would be, um, it's, it's, there would be things like, I'd say, buying the like mass separating agent that might be used in the distillation column. So these are consumable items or items that get recycled internal to your flow sheet to get your process up and running. Okay, so these are these are items that you're going to be play, paying for on an ongoing basis. Okay, and that so within a tax period they would be used up and and that's why it's an eligible expense. Included in eligible expenses there's there's a whole lot more than just those two salaries of your employees are eligible expenses. Photocopiers, internet connections, utilities, electricity, water, all of those raw material costs, like all the raw material coming into your plant, you pay for that, all of those are, those are expenses that get used up. So that's why I say it's easier to define what non-eligible expenses are. We're going to create a separate row for this in our spreadsheets, and every other expense um, can be used to reduce the tax. So, Let's uh, come back to where we ended off last class. We had said uh, that there's multiple classes of depreciation. We're going to see that in, in today's section. But I just illustrated a few here. The main point of each of these blocks is to show that there's different percentages. So the amount by which you can depreciate an equipment 
is varies depending on which class it is. Probably the most important class we'll be concerned with is class 43, which is equipment used for manufacturing of products. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll have you look that up on the CRA website um, and you can read <coughs> through it to make sure that that definition matches. So let's, um, let's just come back here to depreciation. Depreciation starts the day that equipment is put into service. That's the main, the main issue here. So, for example, when I was working at GlaxoSmithKline, the biggest, the biggest concern of the finance department was they said, Kevin, the day you finished installing the equipment, getting it up and running, doing your test work, the day that the, you handed over to the production to start producing tablets on that machine, that's the day you need to tell us so we can start depreciating. Anything I do up to that point is not considered in service. So while I'm testing out the equipment, finding operating conditions that work well, and so forth, that's not considered operation. So depreciation only kicks in the day that you turn that, that switch on to produce product on the equipment. So that's, a, that's an important um, time. So all that time to install the unit, even though you've paid for it, that it may take you a year to install it, get it up and running, that time you cannot depreciate. Okay. We're going to talk a bit about what book value is and illustrate that through an example next. And the book value of the equipment is really a sort of residual value. So we're comfortable with this concept of buying cars and then the value of the car decreases over time due to depreciation. Book value is essentially saying what is the value of that car if it's go sell it. Um, except from an accounting perspective here in this course, book value is no, you may not necessarily get the book value for your product when you go sell it. So for your equipment, then you go sell it. So book value is just an artificial number that keeps increasing over time. It may or may not match what you could get for it on the market if you sold it. Okay, and then the key point here is what is that initial cost of the equipment? Well, it's not only the price you pay to the vendor when you buy it, but it's also the price of installation, engineering, shipping, um, all of those get, get included. So usually the, the cost of the equipment is one number, let's say a million dollars. After you've installed it and prepared your site and got it up and running, that cost has gone up to three million. So that ratio of three to one is quite typical. The equipment costs about one third of the cost to get it installed, shipped, and ready. Okay, we will only in this course consider one depreciation method. There's one that really only the government tends to use. There's another one that they use in one or two classes. Um, I'll talk about that at the end. But we'll look at just this declining balance uh, depreciation. And then there's one other wrinkle that kicks in, okay? And that's the 50% rule. So here's the idea, is that if your period is one year, <coughs> all, all corporations have a period of one year for the taxation. If I buy that equipment, Let's say that the tax year runs from January to December. So there's 31st of December right there on the last day of the period. If I buy that piece of equipment in January, or I buy it in June, or I buy it in December, when do I get to depreciate it in the first year? Same rule, right? So what happens is the government says, oh, because I'm not going to keep track of dates exactly when you buy these things and get them up into service, I'm just going to say the new piece of equipment in the first period, you don't get to depreciate the full value of it. I'm going to assume you installed it in the middle of the year, so you only get to depreciate half in the first year. After that, you get to depreciate the full amount. Um, so that leads to all sorts of interesting things where companies play games and try to buy and get equipment up and running sort of like near the end of the period so that they can maximize that value. But it's um, it's a minor a minor saving. But for large capital items, it can add up. Okay, so let's take a look at, at a picture of what depreciation is, and then we'll look at the formulas to calculate. So here's my book value right at the start of um, some period, and this company is putting this equipment in service on in March. So even though the tax year runs from January to December, March is when that book value kicks in. That's the cost of the equipment and installation. The government allows you to depreciate the book value by a certain amount, but only you only get to write a 50% of that in the first year. So whatever that dollar figure you calculated, you halve it, 
and then the book value drops by, by that amount on the 31st of December, which is the same value on the 1st of January, the next period. And you keep going that year, end of that year you get your write off a whole bunch of depreciation. So that dollar figure, you, you calculate what that depreciation is, subtract it from your prior book value and you update your book value going forward for the next period. So if my next period's book value is lower, I get to write off another depreciation at the end of the year, and then my book value keeps declining. From period to period, that goes down. And notice the delta depreciation that you write off every time becomes smaller and smaller. So you don't get to write off in equal amounts. It's, it's a percentage of the book value. So it's in proportion to the book value is what the depreciation is. And that's exactly what the next slide shows. The depreciation you get to write off that that drop in value D is equal to some multiplier. That's the government class that we look at. So 30%, 20%, 50%. We look that up from tables specified by the government. And in most cases, that's going to be 30% in our course. So 30% of the book value at a particular time at the, at the, at the start of the period. So take the book value, multiply it by 30%. So I get to write off 30% of the book value, and then I update the book value for the next period is prior book value minus the depreciation, and then book value is dropped. The only exception is that very first period, you don't get to write off the full amount D over here, you only get to write off half of what you calculate. Okay, make sense, simple? Simple for a Friday. So let's do an example here. Suncor is looking at buying a new reboiler, $10 million. Reboilers fall in class 43, so a, a depreciation rate of 30%. Calculate what those book values and depreciated amounts are for the next eight years. Just go up to about three or four years to get the, get the, the start of it. Now, here's, here's the only thing I'd like you to do. When you start working with these large dollar figures, we're going to see that 10 to $100 million of typical values we deal with, let's not write out all these zeros. Let's just uh, work in rounded thousands. So when you write $10 million, write it like that instead. Okay. So that's a rounded thousand. $10 million in rounded thousands is just written as 10,000. What is the book value at time zero, book value at time one, time two, time three, and so forth? Okay. value in period zero. <coughs> Ten million. Um, we've ignored installation and all those other costs, so uh, let's just work with that in this, this example. So $10 million is my book value. 
at the end of the year, what is the depreciation I get to write it? 1500. So that's equal to 1500 there. Let's just put a note that that's equal to 10,000 times 0.3 divided by 10. So you get to write a 30% of the value of the item, so 10,000 times 0.3, but only half of it gets written off due to the 50% rule. Okay, that's clear. Next period, what is this, the book value at the start of the period? Seven, sorry. 8,500? 8,500, okay, so 8,500, 10,000 minus 8,500, uh, so just emphasize that the first time. <coughs> Depreciation for the next, uh, for this period one. Two thousand five hundred fifty. So that's thirty percent of the book value price. So two five five. So that's third note there. So that's equal to eight five zero zero. So now we get to write up the full book value in that period. And then the book, uh, the book value on the next period is 8,500 minus 2550, so it's 5950. And then we can calculate the, the next one, the depreciation. So convention I'd like to follow is that whenever you do these calculations in an exam or a test, uh, make detailed notes for the period zero and period one to show your calculations like I've done here. Show what my calculations are. Don't clutter up this table with your calculations embedded in the, in the area because that uh, will lead to just a big mess on your exam script or test. So just put the final values, but then give notes and showing those calculations only for period zero and one. After that, you assume you know what you're doing. Okay, so in this instance, that would be your table that you generate. would look like that, and then we can see that book value declining. So it's got this sort of exponential decline, 10,000, 8,500, and so forth. In fact, with the, this declining balance method, your book value never really reaches zero. As you, imagine, as you can see, if you keep taking 30% of the prior value, you'll never get to zero, but it's, a, it's okay. <coughs> it comes and tracks all of that for you. Uh, then notice the depreciation typically has this pattern where it's, because of the 50% rule, you'll rise up and then decline down again. So straightforward calculating these depreciations. Uh, the government has a little bit of a, there's a bit of more detail to it if you download the actual tables and try to fill them in, you'll come to close these values. There's a little bit of mess that occurs, especially uh, when you've got multiple pieces of equipment in different classes, all being purchased and sold at different times. Uh, the tables get a bit more complex, especially with the sale of equipment happening. So it doesn't change our course by a whole lot. Uh, your, your numbers that we're going to help you here in this class are very, very accurate. But, uh, the people in your accounting department will have a little bit more detail to add to that. But you're not going to make decisions incorrectly in this class uh, based on our level of detail. So now the question is, these depreciated amounts, we've written off 1,500 of the value of our equipment first year, 2,550 the next, and so forth. What, like, where is this? Is this actual dollars that floats around somewhere? But do you see that 1,500 or 2,550? Right. It's not an income, right? Like you'd think it might be an income because this, you're, you're reducing the value of your equipment. Some people see it as an expense sometimes mistakenly because they seem like I'm having to pay for this depreciation somehow. 
Okay, the, the reality is it's neither an income nor an expense. All it does, it doesn't exist physically as cash either. You can't go and sell depreciation and exchange it for something else. Um, but all it does is it simply sits internal to the company system. So if we look at this diagram uh, on two slides on, we've got money coming into our system. We've got money flowing out of our system. One of those flows out of the system is taxes. So we've got all sorts of other expenses, but there's another expense that's pretty big, and that's tax. And all that depreciation does is it's simply an internal mechanism to account for the value of the book value of our equipment. And what it does is it just helps reduce that outflow of money. Would that be quantified as like resale value of the equipment and kind of appreciating its value? You want to actually put some of that money in it. Okay, let's say we finish the project and we sell the equipment, it'll be, we'll be able to sell it for this. In right. case that you can actually do it. In case we can, the problem is that there's, it, all, it, it often doesn't match up with, with what it is. Especially, first, due to time value of money. Um, and then, secondly, your equipment is outdated. So, to find a buyer willing to buy outdated equipment is much much just like it. So, the book value re really almost never reflects accurately what that salvage value is. Yeah. If, I, if you do sell a piece of equipment, um, can you, like, does it matter when you sell it for claiming depreciation for that? Year? Yeah, so what the government will do, so when you sell it, you, you obviously cannot account, account for depreciation any further going forward. Yeah, so it's like just prorated for how like, um, much of the year you get. Exactly. So that's why I say those tables will, will handle that sort of we, we want. We won't deal with salvage because we almost never consider that and, uh, to be a, a valuable amount. Like it's not going to alter our, our decision. Unless, the only time salvage will alter your decision is if you're buying this equipment using it for a short period of time and you know that you're going to do that, then you must take salvage into account to get a fair estimate. Okay, so now this, uh, let's go to this colorful slide which uh, helps understand a bit more where depreciation fits in. Um, this is as complex as it gets and we're going to work through this as an example. Uh, so what, what we'll show here is that we've got our income and our expenses, and we're going to illustrate this principle that depreciation simply reduces our tax rate. So if we look at this formula down here, this, we'll just go back, we saw this earlier, tax paid is taxable income multiplied by the tax rate. So that's fixed, 25%. What's this taxable income? Well, taxable income is defined as the income A plus expenses B, so our expenses up here, notice that only the eligible expenses, but then this is the key thing, minus E, so minus depreciation. So this depreciated amount of 1,500 or 2,550, let's say I'm here in period one, and I'm going through these formulas, I'm calculating my income, my expenses, I get to subtract off that depreciation and then calculate my tax afterwards. So my tax is reduced by this, this depreciated amount. So it's, it's in your advantage as a company to take depreciation into account. The government's not going to say, oh, you forgot to take depreciation into account. Okay, it's up to you to remember and do that. Yeah. Sorry, okay. so during that first period, that period zero, your book value is originally part of your taxable income, and then you just subtract. Okay. This amount. Yes. Okay. So this is ten. Uh, ten mil. This was ten million dollars. So ten thousand is written here. What happens with that ten thousand? What's that exist as a cash flow? That's Is it? Or is it not? Or not taxable? Sorry, totally. Okay. So I am having to buy it. This was the reboiler example. I had to buy a reboiler cost me $10 million. So I have to, there's $10 million flowing out of my bank account. I have to pay someone to buy that reward. So that's actually the money flowing out. So I'm buying that equipment, it's costing me $10,000. <coughs> okay, so the question is, is that an eligible expense? It's not an eligible expense, but it's over here at line C, a non-eligible expense. Okay. And line C, we're gonna see comes up only here at the end, we just keep track of it because all it does is just it's just going to affect my cash flow. The 
cash flow is nothing more than my bank balance. Okay, so absolutely, my bank balance is going to drop by 10 million in the first period. And I just have to live with it. The government doesn't care what's in your bank account. The government just cares what this value is. Okay, the government doesn't come and say, show me your bank balance and I'm going to take 30% or 25% of the bank. The government's principle of taxation is simply to tax you on taxable income. And that's simply income minus expenses that are eligible minus this interesting new feature depreciation. So let's take a look at that through an example. Um, what I'd like you to do is we're going to look at this next example. I'm going to show you how to set this up so that it's just easier to work with on a piece of paper. Uh, normally you would obviously do this on a spreadsheet, but for testing exams we clearly need to work, um, work on paper. So what we do is we write these A, B, C, D, E's down, the rows like this, etc. And then you work with periods in the horizontal direction. So this is period 0, period 1, 2, and so forth. So we're going to look through this example where you do this, and this is going to be our case study. So it's a big, it's fairly detailed. Let's just uh, unpack what's going on here. Here's a company. They're working in the pulp and paper sector. They're buying a new analyzer. It's called a Kappa analyzer for their craft digestion. This new analyzer that goes on their equipment costs $75,000. So that's the capital cost. Then they're going to pay to maintain that piece of equipment. On an annual basis, except for the first year, they're going to have to spend $5,000 to keep that piece of equipment maintained. So that's an expense. Eligible or non-eligible expense? Maintenance. Eligible expense. So okay, capital cost is not an eligible expense. Maintenance cost absolutely is. So they can write that $5,000 off every year um, they just don't pay it in the first year, obviously, because the equipment is new. Increased profits due to pulp quality, $20,000 per year. Income or expense? Income. So they're going to get an additional $20,000 of income to buy and store this analyzer. Depreciate the analyzer using the declining balance method, which we've just looked at. It's got an expected life of five years, no salvage value at the end. Does it matter what the expected life is? Not for the declining balance method. The declining balance method simply says take 30% of your previous year's book value and just keep subtracting it off. So as long as that equipment is actually operating, you can keep deducting 30% off. Just at time zero, we don't know how long to go for. So we ask the manufacturer, well, how long do you think this analyzer will last? They say five years. So in our analysis of the project, we would only go up to five years. It doesn't make sense to go for a longer period of time because the equipment is expected to die or, or need to be replaced after five years. Um, when you say the equipment is expected to last for five years, we're only counting that five years beginning from when the equipment goes into some place. So as generally period zero, we say that whatever it's installation costs and just buying the equipment and then starting. So when we have an end in place, um, we have to have equals five in this case because the first year would be just the Okay, so this is an analyzer. It goes in and gets installed right away. It's an off-the-shelf unit. You just plug it in line, and the day you get it at your company is the day you start using it. Yeah. I, I, there, was a, there was extra detail about that in the, in the original exam question. I've just taken it out to the next slide, but I'm, I'm very specific on, on that. Okay, so here it's January 2014. Your company's year end is end of the year. Assume the equipment is installed and put in service. Oh, there it is, actually. Uh, installed and put in service uh, January 2014. Calculate the payback time, cash flow, NPV, CFRR, etc. So what we're really interested in right now for our analysis is cash flows. Once we have our cash flows, we get the other information for free. Right? So calculate these cash flows and for period zero and period one. So have a, have a try for period zero, and then we'll take it up all together. Period one has got really interesting things that start to happen. Okay, So I'd like to get to period one by the end of class today, so that we can start to see things. This signs start to flip around, and, and interesting things happen from an accounting perspective. So let's, uh, let's set up period zero and period one in today's class.
So this should take you a couple of minutes to appear. So we just want to also one thing to bear in mind. When you're doing this in a test and exam, these little guys that you get, you guys have paid a lot of tuition. Please don't try to minimize your pages. Yeah, I see this all the time. People like write really tiny on one side of the page. <coughs> Open this thing up and use the whole two pages to write your answer. Right? Work all the way across it because you're going to need a lot of space for these. These things cost the university nothing. You might as well make sure that <laughs> two or three of them are these. Okay? So, uh, so spread, spread your work out really big and make clear notes on how to read your calculations. So incoming period one and period zero. Twenty thousand. Okay, expenses in eligible expenses in period zero. Negative five thousand? No. <coughs> zero. There's no eligible expenses in the first period. No maintenance in the first period. It's just in the next period. Okay. Capital expenses in the first period. Negative seventy-five thousand. So our convention is that expenses in rows B and C are not reported as negatives. Book value in period zero. Seventy-five thousand. Depreciation. Eleven thousand two hundred and fifty. So one one two five zero. 
everyone agree? Okay, so in your notes, we can track this, so seven. So depreciation at first period zero is 11,250. That's $11,000 that we get to write off the value of the equipment 31st of December of that year. We get to reduce the book value by 11,250. So what's my taxable income? Any numbers? Okay. Taxable income 8750. Let's make a note of that. Taxable income, recall, was F is A plus B minus E. So taxable income for note 2 is 20,000 plus 0 minus 1125. So there's that decrease in depreciation we were speaking about. We get to reduce our taxable income by that 11,250. So now, even though I've earned $20,000 more in by installing this equipment, I don't have to pay the government 25% of 20,000. I now get to pay them only 25% of that lower value. So I get to pay less tax than I would have otherwise because the government is allowing me to write off $11,000. <coughs> So I pay less tax. I only pay tax on 8750. So how much do I pay? So I've gone on to side by side here. So note number three. Tax paid. So 2188. So how do we calculate that? It's 25% of 8750. One eight seven fifty, and let's just round out. So never use cents in our tables ever. Okay, no dollar symbols, no cents. Just make this uh, make this table really clean. So tax paid is twenty five percent for our assumption of this course. Next line, net cash flow H. What is the value of my bank balance at the end of that year? Net cash flow is what that. Okay, negative 57,188. So H is equal to A plus B plus C minus G. A plus B plus C minus G. Income plus expenses plus capital expenses as well minus the tax paid. So money flowing in, money flowing out from three sources. Going to capital items, going to non-capital items, and going to taxes. So minus 57,188. So we'll just note that as well. There's my fourth note. It's 20,000 plus zero plus minus 7,500. And then the tax paid. The next three lines are, are trivial for the first period. The cumulative cash flow is the same as the cash flow for this first period, period zero. The time value of money cash flow is the same as well. We don't depreciate that. Uh, sorry, we don't uh, deflate it, I should say. And the cumulative time value of money is also that. So those next three rows are the same. Three, these these three rows were not in the original um, slide, but we need these to calculate things like the DCFRR and the payback time. So I'm just keeping track of them. Okay, so now let's get to the really interesting period, which is the next one after that. Revenue. It's 20,000 again. So I earn $20,000 the next year that this equipment is operating. What's my eligible expenses in, in period N1? Negative 5,000. Capital expenses, 
here. Zero. Book value. So six three seven five zero. Let's just make a note of that five. That's equal to seven thousand five uh, seventy five thousand minus one one two five zero. The depreciation I get to write off at the end of this year is 19125. So I get to write off 30% of that 63,000 is what I get to write off. And then my taxable income, I'll just write it up here while I'm here, is negative 4125. What does a negative taxable income mean? So taxable income is income, $20,000 income, minus the $5,000 on maintenance, minus the 19125 we get to write from depreciation. So this is really interesting. I've, even though I've made $20,000 of profit this, this period, I've spent $5,000 of maintenance on that equipment. So I've only made $15,000 really on that, on that unit. But the government's allowing me to write a depreciation of $19,000. My depreciation exceeds the profit I've made. Okay, so actually, here I get a negative now of minus 4125. So I've made a loss. I mean, my income minus expenses is 15,000, but I've then got this additional 19,000 that the government legally allows me to write off this depreciation. So my taxable income is negative. If the tax paid, how much tax do I pay? Zero. Zero dollars tax. The government's generous, very generous for companies. It allows them to carry their losses forward. So minus one over three one. The government gives you a check for $1,031. They don't actually give you a check, they just simply keep it as a credit and they allow you to take it forward to the next year. But we still record that as a negative tax paid for our purposes. So minus one of three one. Five percent of minus four one two five gets me back <coughs> minus one one three one. Okay, so then like the next one is the like cash flow is twenty thousand dollars income minus the five thousand plus zero minus this minus one over three one. So income minus cap minus eligible expenses minus capital expenses minus tax, tax is negative, so that negative, negative there, and that gets me 16031. It's 25% tax rate, that's the corporate tax rate. Okay, so in this next period then, um, my net cash flow is 16031. That's note number nine everywhere. Okay, then uh, cumulative cash <coughs> in my bank account is this what I had at the end of the previous period plus my new cash flow is minus 41,157. So just note that line 10 is equal to minus what I had in the previous period, minus 57,188, plus my new amount coming in, get me minus 41,157. And then the next two lines, I'll just write it up while I'm here. I take time value of money into account on that one sixth, that $16,000. Taking time value of money into account, because that's actually a year from now, I get to divide by 1.08. <coughs> 
So that's uh, my company's uh, time value of money. I'm using a TVM of 8%. So 16031 in one year from now is worth a little less. It's worth 14,844. Future cash flow. And then the last line is the cumulative time value of money is minus 57,000 plus the 14,000 which gets me minus 42. So by hand, we've done the period zero, period one. What I'd like you to do is to duplicate what's on the next slide here, which is to show um, the full sequence for the next five years. Um, and what you can show then is actually this equipment actually never really pays for itself. By the end, even taking a uh, time value of money into account, um, you, you don't actually end up with a profit. You end up making a loss in this piece of equipment. And the ECFRR is 0% in this case. So it never really pays to take itself back. So just prove that to yourself. We'll be doing examples like this in the tutorial.